Afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon now. Uh, so it's, I'm going to try to keep this a bit short because I know all of you are tired and you've got a lot of other stuff to do. So I know a lot of you are taking pictures of slides. That's great. I like that. Um, but to save you some bandwidth, I've put all the slides on the web. So uh, you can go to this bit.ly link. Uh, you just have to take this picture and then you're all set. You can zoom just on the link. Okay, so uh, you can get the slides yourself. Actually, I love presentations, and I'll talk more about them later, but I want to first convince you that documents are small, and they're worth mining. So um, let me tell you a little bit about the skinny of big data. So this is an art installation. Um, it's nice. And uh, this is one of the amazing things you can do with big data, right? You can go to Flickr, do a Creative Commons first search, and find lots and lots of great photographs that you can insert into keynote talks like this because, you know, uh, us as scientists, we don't take very good pictures. Okay, so uh, you can find infographics about big data. You already have heard so many talks about big data, volume, velocity, and variety. We know that we post a lot of social media. We can mine all of that social media to create knowledge, as our Prof. Lee just has expounded upon, uh, to create a knowledge graph. But, you know, uh, all of that is a lot of work, right? We all know if you've dealt with Twitter feeds, there's a lot of data that you have to do to clean it, right? So there's a joke uh, going around that says, you know, a data scientist is the new job that people get paid a lot to do, right? But if you've looked at Facebook posts, they'll say data scientist actually means data janitor, right? What does that mean? It means we have to spend a lot of time cleaning up that data because it's noisy, right? Twitter has so much data, but most of it is about, you know, people what they're eating, things that are not actually expressible in the academic circles. You know, it's not uh, nice to say in public. But um, really, what is all of that data like? What is big, big data like? Well, so social media data is something that we uh, hear about every day. How big is it actually? So if you look at Facebook and Twitter, you take the five largest social networks. It's over a billion posts daily. Okay, so I've given you some citations, so you can look them up. I spent most of yesterday, well, early morning today, finding out these facts. Um, so that's quite a lot of data, right? What about science, right? This is social stuff, you know? This is you and me talking in the hallways, but doing it online, you know, sitting in a lab, chatting next to each other, not actually getting up and talking, but, you know, chatting through I am, let's go to lunch. Okay, no, I'm not ready yet, five minutes later. Okay, so we just, you know, we're sitting next to each other, but we're using social media to communicate. Okay, but what about science? Is science big as well? Yes, of course. We know that the raw data that we are manufacturing from sensors everywhere is huge. All right, this is just one day's worth of data. Right, we're getting terabytes of data, of climate data, atmospheric data, astronomy data, okay? And these are only sample sets that are out there. So for example, if you look at raw astronomy data, this is from some sky surveys, just one out of many in the US. Again, terabytes of data per day, all right? That's amazing, that's a lot bigger than this book stack. So, big versus small. I have 1,000 squares up here, right? That means one million items of posts per day are up there, right? So this is basically on the order of what we as a society, as a civilization, produce each day, right? On the read write web, on web 2.0. Daily social media production. What do you think this is? I'll answer that in the question in a minute. What is that white square representing? All of those white squares. That's 158 million items. What is that? What's that am I going to tell you about? Well, I'm not going to give you the answer right away because good keynote talks, they don't give you answers, right? They just give you questions, right? So let's go and think about um, something else. All right, so I'm going to take one of those squares. I'm going to blow it up. 
And I'm going to say, this is one million so uh, social network posts. This is something that you cover in a couple minutes, right, about daily. So let's say I just started talking. We've already made a million social network posts in the world. And if I cut that up into boxes, if my cursor will work, okay, then I have a thousand squares, right? A thousand, a thousand is a million, right? How much of that is what we produce in scientific literature per day? How many items do we make per day from science? Any guesses? It actually shows up at the scale. This is how much we make as a civilization in knowledge every day. 4,200 publications per day. Isn't that amazing? So let me ask you, what was that 158 million white squares? That is the sum total of human knowledge. That is 158 million books that is in the Library of Congress over the entire lifespan of human civilization. Okay? We take that to lunch every day by creating social media. Isn't that scary? Okay, so I thought I'd have some fun. You know, I'd make you a nutritional chart. Okay. The amount of PhD graduates every day that we uh, every every day that we graduate in the US is about five hundred. Five hundred knowledge workers every day. That is no in all doctoral programs in the US. If you get the slides, you click on that link, it will show you the table from the US statistics. Okay, where I derived this data from. So I, I, you know, I used my calculator. I typed it in. You know, we have about 100,000 U.S. graduates, doctoral graduates per year. Social media, we make over a billion posts a day. Earth sciences, this is just two samples, terabytes a day. But how much do we make in scholarly publications? I already showed you the scale. It's so staggering. Just trace amounts. You know, you look at those ingredient labels on the back of packages, it says, you know, vitamin C in this cyanide cereal, trace amount, you know, but they can still put it on the package on the front. Vitamin C in my cereal, right? So I'm going to say the same thing. There is big data out there, but there's also small data. And that small data is absolutely valuable. So, my question to you. We're all here. Talk about big data. Big data, six magnitudes, all right? 10 to the six larger than small data that I'm talking about. Why on earth should we care about it? So I found this on Flickr yesterday night. I thought it was quite fitting because it's a Mini Cooper and it's the Union Jack. This is sponsored by the High Commission of the British government. Okay, so I'd like to tell you, if you hear big data is the oil, of the future, then I'm going to argue that small data is the new jet fuel. Okay? It's what's going to power our knowledge in the next generation. Okay? We have to pay attention to this. We cannot forget where we are producing our knowledge, right? where it ends up. All of this talk that we are talking about, publishing works, etc., SIGIR, ACM, uh, multimedia, EMNLP, where does it end up? We have to read it. Right? So, it's quite telling actually if you t take a look at what people say in their articles. So, this is a publication that just came out this year in August. It's from the astronomy community. There's astronomers talking about their own data. Right? What are they talking about? They're saying that all of the data that they're sharing, that people are worried about, in not web science, but data science. Right? Well, sharing that data out there and making it uh, provision to other people so they can replicate experiments, that's great and all, but that is primary data. That's the raw data. Right? Those are like the Twitter posts that we think about. Okay? Before cleaning, before sanitization. Right? But it would be a lot better in some ways to make that data available in a secondary form. Right? The derived data. What we use to write our publications is not the raw Twitter data. 
It's all the process mess that we go through afterwards, all the analytics that you saw Prof. Chua Tatsang showing you all those nice things. That's what we use to write papers, right? We don't share that. We don't know how to share it yet. But it's a magnitude or magnitude smaller, right? So it's actually really important that we can do this well. So why? Because there's more signal, less noise. Okay? Astronomy data is based on derived data, making such data visible, intelligible, and available to the public is of fundamental importance. It's also something that is very heavily curated. You've probably read this as a PhD student. I read PhD students all the time, uh, comments, sorry, all the time to make sure I'm still in sort of perspective of a PhD student. So, you know, this is a joke, right? Uh, about uh, especially the last part here, you know, uh, the last offer is the head honcho of the paper. He hasn't even read the paper, but he got the funding, and his name is famous, so we put him on the paper, right? Okay, the point about this is that there are six offers here. All of them hopefully have read the paper. When we create human knowledge for other humans to understand, we invest a lot of time in it, right? What about your tweet? Did you spend a lot of time writing it? How many people are going to read it? Did six people proofread it before it got sent to press? Did it get peer-reviewed before it got to press? No! Why are we spending so much time worrying about big data when we don't have enough time and attention to small data? So, if I've convinced you that our scholarly publications, the very text that we produce for ourselves, it's worthwhile to study, then what types of problems can we do with it? Well, we can think of at least two target audiences. Okay? Managers. What do they care about? We want to manage our scientists, manage our faculty. We want to know whether they're producing well, whether they're competitive on a global scale. You know, what type of ranking would they get if they compared to peers? Would I tenure them or not? Okay? As offers, you know, all of us here are PhD students or uh, postgraduates or professors. What do we want to care about? Maybe we care about the reproducibility, you know, about being able to now crowdsource that data, let the public play with that data, as in Citizen Zoo, uh, Galaxy Zoo or other social machines that uh, David Rohr had maybe talked about before. Okay, being able to identify research trends, that's something I need to do as a professor to help my graduate students figure out what is the important problem three years from now that they need to study now. Okay, and venue finding, right? I'm going to publish a paper, where do I put it to have maximum impact? That is sort of uh, brokered by search engines such as Google Scholar and Google in general, but still we have to do a good job of that. But I'll offer you one hint here that we haven't done. That is, pay attention to people who actually read these publications. I want you to think about that for a second. What do I mean? Okay, it's quiz time. What is a digital library? Can anyone tell me what a digital library is? Don't be shy. This is supposed to be you know, the presentation before you get your lunch, so you have to work for it. Anyone want to take a stab at it? Oh, suddenly everyone's looking down at their paper. That happens all the time when I give lectures, too. <laughs> Sir, yes? Let me guess. A library with digitized resources. Okay, a library of digitized resources. That's exactly right. This is what people tell me a digital library is. It is a dump of PDF files, right? What do we do with a digital library? We go Google, search for something, Google, Google Scholar, search for something. Oh, there's a paper. It's about something I care about. Download, print, on dead trees, right? Mark it up, finish, right? Is there something wrong with this picture? Right? Why are we using PDF files? Why are we use, even printing them out? You know, a, a digital library is not constrained by the artifacts that we have in the past. Right? We have computers. We have knowledge graphs, for crying out loud, right? Prof. Lee just told us this. 
right? Can't we use those technologies to introspect what we produce, right? A scholarly publication is not an atomic element that cannot be introspected, but that's what we treat it as. We say, oh, we want to measure things about this scholarly publication. Do we even look at what's inside of that? No, right? What do we do? Oh, we count downloads, we count citations, we count who's on the offers. We have no idea of the words that are in that document. That's scary, right? So actually, you think about it. People have been studying this idea of a digital library for a long time. They thought, okay, we want to support reuse. We we're going to give you tools to help you reuse your citations, right? To support sharing that metadata so that you can cite it easier. We are computer scientists. We're excessively narcissistic. We like to measure how many times we're liked, right? Favorited. That is called a citation, right? So you can look all, all, up all of us, myself included, on Google Scholar. You can get. Satisfied, wow, I got a couple citations today, not so bad, right? Okay, and to find the prestige of an offer. But we left out someone very critical. Who's actually reading our papers? Right? The knowledge that we produce. Right? We want to actually help people produce new science. That means we have to know what's in there. We need to know what's in our documents. Okay, so beginning researchers, for example, how do they find out about science? Policy makers and professors, how do we help them strategize about their research? And how do we read and annotate the document of record? So let's start off by going back to the scientific method. What is that? So it starts off when a new student comes to my office, they're enthusiastic. Man, I want to learn about um, artificial intelligence and search engines. Right? Then they discover, uh, they say, oh, Google Scholar is such a great resource. Right? It's not to everything. And then they say, oh my god, I've got to read like five million papers. Right? And then they have to drill down. This is usually with expert help. They say, okay, I'm going to try and concentrate on these 50 papers. Right? Then sort of start to understand what they are, compare across documents, find out what's important, what's not, report, right? do experiments, execute, communicate their ideas, distill what their knowledge is, what's important and new about their, what they've done, why is it significant, and communicate it to others right? in a presentation like today. Okay. So we look at this, this is an hourglass figure, right? Because we start off being very broad and encompassing. And then at the end, towards that focus, when we're actually producing new knowledge, communicating it to others, it's very narrow, right? We also have to do the second part, which some graduate students forget, which is that we have to communicate that knowledge. Once you write a paper, you're not done. You have to sell that research to others. You have to know why that's important not just through a bunch of diagrams, right? So research is really an apprenticeship, right? We do the same thing, right, as professors or faculty. We tell our students, okay, you try to search, we help them with searching. No, 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 that venue is no good, this offer is much better than you think, etc. By reading the paper with them, saying, oh yeah, pay attention to the related work section, go chase references, you know, writing together, listening to each other, uh, presenting, performing that work, and creating new information. And then finally, teaching others about it, right? That's what we do in conference presentations. So I would like to argue that when we think about digital library and small documents, small data, this is what we should be doing. We should be doing research that helps the reader, okay? That means, for example, making digital library systems that can help annotate help label that information that we've created. Make that data actionable. We've already heard from Prof. Lee just in the previous keynote that you know, all of this web data, we can actionable it, right? We can put it together, we can integrate it, and it can enable other applications. We should know more about citations. This is something that we care about very much as a scholarly community, 
citations? What types of functions do they have? And where do ideas come from? Okay, and finally, because I see all of you in the audience taking pictures of uh, slides, I want to talk about presentation to document alignment. So um, this begins the meat of the talk. It's not very long, so I'm not going to get in technical depth. But let's say we have a digital library that's on the web. And let's say, just like you took pictures of slides, that you could highlight passages. Okay? And that uh, those highlights would be anonymized and then aggregated together. Then you go to a scientific document, wow, you can see which sections are important because everyone's clicked on or highlighted certain parts of that document. Now this is already becoming a reality. There's a startup called Mendeley, which is now no longer a startup, but there are a couple different uh, organizations that are doing exactly this, you know, allowing the aggregate of citizen science, the aggregate of crowdsourcing to define what are important parts of documents. Okay? We can do it in research too. My group has looked at trying to figure out uh, which parts of the documents are important through key phrase analysis, etc. But uh, this is extended uh, in other ways. So one very interesting thing that I think is very useful but very simple is the idea of argumentative zoning. This comes from work from Simone Teufel at Cambridge. What she did is define six major functions of sentences in scientific papers. Okay, so this was restricted to computational linguistics, but bear with me. The idea is that you might be able to find sentences that define the aim of the current paper, okay, what the, the paper is supposed to be doing, uh, base of the current paper, work that it is uh, uh, based on, okay, general scientific knowledge that everyone's supposed to know about that doesn't need citation, and very importantly, things like contrast what things contradict the previous work, okay? So being able to automatically classify sentences in a scientific document with respect to these categories can help us quickly understand that document, right? In fact, if you look at the abstract, you might think that's a good starting point as a summary of the document. But as you can see, just on this slide alone, there are sentences outside of this uh, abstract that tell you about the aim of the paper. And I'll come back to this as an important point. So um, this is technical stuff, but basically we treat this as a supervised classification task. We build features for it, we classify it, and then we can go on from there. Okay, but being able to extract that type of metadata to help us, a student or a beginning researcher, understand which parts of a document are important is only one step. Okay, we can also try to extract key metadata from these papers. So let me give you an example from math. Okay, we all know in math we have theorems like Pythagorean theorem. Okay, we can search on that in Google, but we also know that it has an alternative mathematical, a symbolic form, right? A squared plus B squared equals C squared. How many search engines take the presence of a, a semantically equivalent equation in account when they do document ranking? Zero, right? Okay, so this is a big problem. Let's say you were doing scientific method and you created a new version of a random walk model and you wanted to know whether your equations are similar to someone else's equations, right? Maybe it's also derived something from statistical physics. In fact, a lot of our methods in computer science inherit from physics, right? So we would be, we would be very helped by having a search engine cater for that information. Okay? Another example from our group's work is in nursing. All right? If you've ever talked to a nurse or a doctor, you know they're even busier than graduate students, hard as it may be to believe. Okay? But they have a hard time keeping up with facts about their patients. Okay? Let's say you're a nurse in a ward, you're taking care of uh, Indonesian females between the ages of 30 to 35. If you look at the titles of some of these documents here, I don't think you can read them, but it says something like impact of invasive and non-invasive quantitative culture sampling, etc. It doesn't tell you anything about what types of patients are under their care. Right? But critically, that's what I need to know as a ward nurse. I need to know whether this scholarly literature matches the patients in my ward. If it does, then it's relevant. If it doesn't, I don't have time to read it. Okay? 
So by using things like machine reading, never ending learning, etc., all of the things that Prof. Lee talked about, we can extract this data. We can extract information about the sex of the patients, their condition, their race, their age, and put it into metadata that is actionable. We can create filters that allow us to filter for that automatically. Okay, we can also do citation analysis. I think a couple days earlier you heard a talk by David Rohr, right? So his, this is his Google's uh, profile page. You can see he's very heavily cited, a very popular offer. And you'll see that his top cited paper as of this morning was 620 citations as automatically determined by an algorithm, right? Now my question to you is, do you know what those citations are for, right? We know their count, we know he's popular, but why is he being cited? I want to know what those citations mean. Do they refer to the whole paper? Do they refer to a specific part of the paper or a theorem or a method or a data set? Okay. Why do people cite? What functions might there be for a citation? Okay. So let's take a look at this paper. This is Ontological User Profiling and Recommendation Systems by um, our, our author. Okay. And you can see all of the different, four different citations I've pulled out. They're quite different from each other, okay? Some of them, for example, the one in the middle here, okay, is a list citation. That means there's several citations made in a row to support a statement. Now, do you think that's a very important type of uh, citation? Or maybe it's not as important as a single citation. One where somebody says specifically this paper is mentioned for something. Okay. So these have different functions, right? So a list citation we already know actually from the scholarly literature is less important. People say something like, you know, support vectors machines have been used for a number of applications, right? And then they say uh, square bracket one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, right? Okay. So all of those citations, they're just examples. You know, they add to somebody's citation counts, but it really doesn't help us understand what they're being known for. Okay. So we have found out that the context of citations is really important, being able to understand where it's located in a document and its syntactic structure. Okay. Also, uh, from other groups, we know that citations' importance and their sentiment changes over time. This is a, 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 a natural language processing paper. The orange line shows you the descriptive number of citations, how many times people cited it just to describe it. But interestingly, you'll see that there's a light blue line over here that goes up over time. And this is weakness. Okay? So you can expect when you publish a new work, you know, everything is, everybody thinks it's the best thing on earth, right? It's the latest methodology. But over time, people start to criticize it because there are new methods that have come out. Okay? So being able to understand how these citations function, what type of sentiment they have over time, is very important to understand what role these sentences have with respect to describing that paper. We're also concerned about idea or citation provenance. Okay? On the left-hand side of this uh, visualization, you can see there's a paper. There's a claim made in that paper, okay, and there's a citation here. Now, if you wanted to check whether that, this paper, this thing at all, 2006, actually said this information, how would you do it now? You would actually have to search in Google Scholar, find that document, download it, print it out, and then read the paper and then find out, oh, yeah, here it is. That's where it is, right? We don't have to do that, right? That's silly. We have computers that can digest this automatically. Right? can read using machine reading or using IR techniques. Find the most relevant passage in this thing at all paper 2006 and then show it on the screen. That's what I did over here, right? Okay, this is automatic. We can do this now. All right, find the most similar passage in another document that was cited that supports a claim. There are other people who are very much interested in this. I think some of you who are from the UK know about Force 11. Many of us may not. Okay, Force 11 is a, a large uh, group of scientists who are very interested in the future of research communication. 
Okay, so um, there are other natural language processing scientists, Graham Hurst is one of them at Toronto, who are interested in being able to do this, right? Being able to find out the idea, where did the idea originally come from, who was responsible for it, and how has it been communicated over time? Okay, I'm going to end with a couple of last things. I took this earlier, I apologize to you in the audience who are captured, okay? So actually, we attend workshops like this one to learn from each other, right? Right? And there are lots of scientific papers in our, our, our proceedings, right? Proceedings of SIG IR, proceedings of ACM multimedia, right? But the problem with the proceedings is they're too detailed and the slides are not detailed enough, right? So what we need to do is use both together, right? We need to create a system a little bit like this, okay? that allows us to go between the two versions of the document. Okay, if I can uh, stretch the imagination a little bit and say that the slides are also a version of the document. Okay, and allow us to move between both modalities easily. Right? I'm looking at the slide, I want to know what Min was talking about. I want to zoom to the paper that he published on this topic. Okay, read that part and then, okay, I got bored of the paper, I want to go back to the slides. Okay. And we can do this, okay? We can do this using natural language processing techniques. We can think of it as a very simple uh, alignment problem of uh, n slides with k paragraphs from a paper and juxtapose them, okay? And create an alignment map as a result of that, okay? And in fact, this becomes a very multimedia problem because the types of slides that are out there, some of them are good for text alignment. Okay? But some of them are terrible for text alignment. So for example, graphs and charts, the things that most of us like to take pictures of, right, to include in our own lectures, they're absolutely terrible to align because we don't have enough text to align it together. Okay? So we did some uh, error analysis of using a textual baseline that just uses simple cosine similarity. And we can find that actually quite a lot of information is lost, right? When there's an image, a nice slide that has a pic pictorial graph, okay, 81% of these are not aligned very well by baseline processes. Uh, I will leave it as a cliffhanger for you to find out how we solve this problem later. Okay, the final topic I'm just going to roughly hint about is scientific document summarization, okay? And as I told you before, the abstract is not a very, it's not the only version of record that tells us about the document, right? Because the abstract is what people themselves think are important about a paper. But if you accumulate citations over time, you have another source of information, right? The citation sentences, the citation context. That's what the community as a whole thinks is important about the paper. And arguably, it's more important than what the author thinks is important about their own paper. Okay, so we want to be able to use that information about citations, okay, in papers, even in presentations. I have made some citations in this slide document. There's no system currently out there that can mine these presentations for citations, okay, and be able to link this information together. So in our group, we've also been working on related work summarization. This is an interesting topic where we take a scientific paper, we remove the related work section, we keep the citations, and we ask the computer to generate the related work section for you. That means, for example, writing your literature survey, right? Wouldn't that be nice? Okay, I just Google my area, text categorization, okay, send it to Min system. Oh, I finished writing my survey paper. Thank you, I'm off to vacation now, right? But that's the idea. We can do some of this so that we can automate the processing and make it easier for our junior researchers to understand what are important works in an area. So I'm going to finish up. Basically, uh, in the natural language and computational linguistics community, we have, we're in charge of our own publications. All the things that you heard about in the uh, natural language processing community are open source. You can get all the documents PDFs for free, there's no copyright encumbrance. You can mine to your heart's content. In fact, I'm the editor of the ACL anthology, and what we are trying to do is insert machine-readable layers, right? 
So you've heard about the PDF uh, being a document of record, but we need to get the data out of the PDF into raw text so that we can mine it. Okay? So we've started on this process, this mission, to take all of the documents that we have in the ACI anthology, find machine-readable versions of them, okay, and allow uh, downstream systems to mine it, okay, to create keywords, to create other things, uh, to create uh, summaries for them. Okay? And I'll note that there have been other people, especially in the UK, have been concerned about this. Some of you may have attended Beyond the PDF 2, which is another conference that happened before. There are people considering the XML as the final version of the document. Don't give us PDF, give us the raw XML data, and then we can use that to mine or produce something readable. We have a system within our group that does something similar. You give it a PDF file, it can recover the uh, raw text, tell you the sections, tell you uh, bibliographic information of the reference strings. It's open source. You can take a look at it at the URL down there. Okay. So the last thing is that I'm going to reiterate uh, Prof Lee's call earlier. You know, the fact that the knowledge graph is very important. Okay. In the U.S., there's a very big project that's going on now called the Big Mechanism Project, okay? And you can't read this, so I'm going to read just one section for you, which is this part right down here in the middle, okay? Which is the Big Mechanism Project uh, aims to develop technology to read research abstracts and papers to extract pieces of causal information, assemble these pieces into more complete causal models, and reason over these models to produce explanations. The domain of the program is cancer biology with an emphasis on signaling pathways. Okay, so what am I trying to say is that, you know, there's government funding from the U.S. and the U.K. being channeled into these areas where we want to machine read the small data of scholarly documents. Okay, so with that, I'm going to conclude. I would like to thank you for listening to my keynote. Basically, I would like to say that we need to also pay attention to small data. Small data is very valuable. It consumes a lot of our bandwidth to create. And if we analyze this data, we can use it to graph findings that we have from big data, hang it off like Christmas decorations so that we can understand what's going on next. Thank you very much for your time.